Uh, my phone lines have gone into gridlock meltdown. Uh, you guys just keep calling. We're going to get you on this hour. We're going to take a full hour with L.A. to basically promote his product, promote him, promote his viewpoint. I want everybody to go to his website, lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-D-U-L-L-I.net. I want you to completely uh, max out his capacity at his website this morning. I want everybody to go there and read what he has to offer and listen to this man. He's been studying this stuff a lot longer than I have, and he's basically one of the most educated men in this field. Uh, Jerry in Ohio, let me finish that phone call with you real quick. The shots that are being currently given, I don't believe are going to change our DNA. I believe the Franken foods are going to be more changing our DNA than anything else because of epigenetics. I believe that we're going to start causing problems in our children and in our grandchildren. And we know with, with mice when they're given the GMO foods after several generations that we're longer able to reproduce. I believe that's what's going to happen with our kids in the United States and throughout the world that are using GMO foods. I believe that that's going to be used to rewrite the DNA. I also believe that the mark of the beast could be some type of injection or some type of DNA change in which God will no longer recognize us, us, recognize us as humans because our God is a loving God and it seems strange to me that when you receive the mark of the beast there remains no sacrifice for your sin so to speak and you end up basically end up going to hell without a do over get over you know to get it get, get it over get it over hard and so I personally believe that God no longer recognizes you as human if you start allowing them to put these implants in you and all these things willingly even though I hopefully he'll give us a chance to have them removed I don't know how that's going to work what do you think about the implant the mark of the beast six 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 and what's going to happen with that do we have a do we have a do we have a get out of hell free card on that deal L A or are we going to just be messed up if we do that. It's really interesting. I've actually written about this and talked about it extensively um, in the Cosmic Chess Match, uh, the book that preceded um, uh, the book that preceded Amitriel of the Nephilim. Look, we believe that going back to Genesis three, the enemy there can be a seed war between the fallen one seed, Satan's seed, and the seed of the woman. The preliminary DNA evidence which we've taken from the elongated skulls which we show in Amitriel of the Nephilim. One and two, specifically in Peru at the Paracas Museum. These elongated skulls, yes, many of them are done through cradle headboarding where they take the infant and they bind the head and they create a cone head type. But that doesn't account for all of the skulls. And we see some aberrations in some of these skulls where only one parietal plate, a lack of a sagittal suture, which should create two parietal plates, is only one parietal plate. Um, some of these skulls show a greater capacity um, of, of, of a brain size, up to 30% more uh, cranial capacity than a normal human being. But listen, this is what the preliminary DNA evidence, this is from a geneticist who I have entered into a contractual agreement. Once we get the permits to get the samples legally out of Peru, they're going to go right to this lab, and, and we'll tell you what we find. But the preliminary DNA evidence is telling. And we, we talk about this in Amitriel of Nephilim Volume 2. Listen to what it says. Whatever the sample 3A has come from, it had mitochondrial DNA with mutations unknown in any human, primate, or animal known so far. The data is very sketchy, though, and a lot of sequencing still needs to be done to recover the complete DNA sequence. But a few fragments I was able to sequence, get this now, from this sample indicate that if these mutations will hold, we are dealing with a new human-like creature very distant from Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovans, I am not sure it will even fit into the known evolutionary tree. Wow. Now, that is incredible. Wow. And you would think that you would have, you know, Darwinists and, and scientists and geneticists running down there to check this thing out flatline. No one cares. No one cares. Well, I think, that, I we think care. they care. I think they care, L.A., but I don't think they want to talk about it because I don't think they want to be caught up in that supernatural realm. Well, I think go. a lot of the Luciferians that basically run the world don't want anybody to talk about it because they control the AP wire and they control Reuters. And so they don't want people to know the truth of what's going on because the truth will set the people free. Okay, let's go ahead and go back to the phones. Kyle in Montana, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve in Virginia, go ahead. Yes, sir. thank you very much. I had a couple of questions, if possible. Uh, I was thinking about the Nephilim the other day, actually, and uh, is there anything that can be said about the relationship, or is there one between the, the, these, these hybrids uh, walking around uh, today and the descendants from the Khazars, you know, the false Hebrews who are, uh, of course, uh, continue to be a problem, and uh, uh, I know a lot of people don't even recognize that that aspect, but do, are, are, can you, are these people, uh, some of them maybe uh, 
actually uh, Nephilim or they... Okay, so what, what you're saying is that the Khazars, a lot of them were basically brought into Judaism, but they're not really from Hebrew descent. And a lot of these Khazars have been involved in global politics, including with the Rothschild banking cartel. And yeah. basically the subversion... Okay, I, I, I've got that. I know that whole theory on what you're talking about. And basically a lot of these guys are basically Luciferians and they're Satanists. Uh, they're not even Jewish. They're just Satanists. And right. basically uh, they trace their lineage back to the Nephilim all the way back to Nimrod. And what do you know about that, L.A.? I mean, how does that, that – I mean, are these guys who are running the planet, these Luciferians who basically trace their lineage back to Nimrod, and they say they can do it all the way back through their their, their charts? Is there any reality to that? Are these people – I know they really believe it, but do you think that's accurate? What's in, in, in Watches 5, we interviewed a man by the name of Chris Blake, and what's interesting about this – is uh, Chris worked for a very uh, low profile but extremely wealthy individual. Uh, so, and this man had, had heads of state would come and visit him, presidents would come and visit him. I first heard about him on Brad Metzler's um, uh, show, Spear of Destiny. Yep, exactly. And I contacted Chris, and he came um, and he talked to us. And one of the things that he we said we have this on camera, um, Chris's comments. There's a group of people who call themselves the sons of the Nephilim, and they are here and are awaiting uh, their man, the Antichrist, uh, who will proclaim himself God in a rebuilt temple. Now, that's a direct quote from Chris Blake, and we, we have him on film in Watchers 5 when I sat down and did a very extensive interview, and it makes sense. You know, folks believe that somehow the Antichrist is just going to show up. There's a cadre, a cabal of people who are actively and have been actively um, trying to push the ball forward for his manifestation. Paul talks about this 2,000 years ago when he says the mystery of iniquity is working. That has never stopped working, and it's going to continue to work until the time of the end. And it is a seed war, and the Antichrist, in, in essence, will be a Nephilim, will be the seed of the serpent. Wow. Okay, I, you know, it's so funny that you said that, L.A., because I thought I was the only person that had watched that Brad Metzler decoded series on the Spear of Destiny, in which they, interv they interviewed. Fascinating, this fascinating, fascinating. Oh, no, and, that's just, and, I've, and I've promoted multiple times that people watch it, and it's funny you would quote the same guy, because he says the same thing you just said exactly, and, of course, you've got him on tape saying it, that there's, there's this group of people, they trace their lineage all the way back yes. to Lucifer. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve, any other questions on that? Yes, uh, no, I, but but some of these 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 uh, I say hybrids. Uh, they uh, uh, they are some of these other people or working with them, I suppose, uh, working with the the uh, uh, Kazarians. Could you say? Uh, well, as far as the Luciferians, I believe that that's probably accurate. I believe they really can trace their lineage back. I know that they would like to be part of the Nephilim, part of the hybrid, part of the Luciferian clan. Uh, whether they are or not, I don't know what their records actually show, but I know that they believe that that's exactly what your man. Well, what was the man? What was his name again? Uh, L.A. The guy Chris Blake. Chris Blake. Blake. That, because he because he said that very clearly on that show. He said, they, I remember Brad asked him, he says, do you believe this? He goes, well, I don't know. I know what they're telling me. Because, but I know one thing. They believe what they're saying. Right. They're willing to die for it. I remember he said They're willing to die word. for it. Correct. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, Steve. Okay, let's go to Kyle in Montana. Go ahead, Kyle. I have a couple of quick questions. One, uh, I'd like to know what Mr. Marzulli uh, thinks about the fact or the possibility that there could have been a giant – uh, DNA in Noah's son's wives, and number two, do you think that uh, if you get this DNA sequence from uh, Peru, that you would be able to find uh, the DNA of, the, of any kind of a lineage that is present day? Well, let me answer the first one. Um, we see a vetting process in Genesis 6. Uh, and, and the Most High God does this two times. He says, Noah, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives. That's a vetting process. There's no way around that. He's calling it out. He's taking the time to be incredibly specific. He says, Noah, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives. Why would a Most High God somehow wipe out the entire planet Wipe out the entire planet, all life on the planet, and then somehow he misses Ham's wife? I don't buy it, not for a second, and I think it's an insult to God. Now, through Ham's lineage, yeah, all sorts of nonsense happens after the flood. And this gets back into the multiple incursion theory. The people who are, who are espousing that Ham's wife was a Nephilim do so because they don't believe in a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, 
incursion. I do. I believe Sodom and Gomorrah, another Nephilim incursion. Tower of Babel, Nephilim incursion. Um, the conquest of Canaan, Nephilim incursion. <clears throat> and the Nephilim tribes, and I talk about this in, in, in Amateur of the Nephilim, Volume 1 and Volume 2, a Nephilim tribe living in the Levant, there was a diaspora, and they, they fled the Levant. They fled the Promised Land, as Joshua and Caleb. If that's the case, should we see evidence of that? Yes, we do. All through the Americas, we talked about this in, in the first part, Ralph Gliddon out on Catalina Island, and the, and the nine-foot giant that we found, that I found, specifically in the museum, in the archives, just tucked away. A black and white photograph clearly showing a very large uh, skeleton. Uh, in in in, uh, in front of Ralph Glidden. We also found elongated skulls, two pictures of those, which other researchers have overlooked. That's also in the book. We also found a six-fingered skeleton, and we, met, we extrapolated the size of that, about a nine-footer. So we see vestiges of the remains of a Nephilim all through the Americas, and I would I would – so far, my theory is this, that the elongated skulls that we see in Paracas are the remnants of a Nephilim tribe. Can I prove that? No. But the DNA evidence will certainly, or the preliminary DNA evidence, is pointing to an outside agency manipulating the genome, which is exactly what we read in Genesis 3. Now, you know, you, you, know, you know what's interesting about this, L.A., and, and Kyle, that's an excellent question, by the way. Uh, but what I've found is this. You know, and I, I, I've thought about this because I've pondered this, okay? When you start reading this stuff, you start pondering it. You start thinking about it and completely hashing it over in your mind, trying to figure out plausible explanations. And the whole thing in Genesis 6, 6 when it says they were there before and after the flood, and if you don't understand that particular verse of Scripture, then you're going to be confused with all of this because here's the thing. If these alien beings, these fallen angels, these basically watchers or these satanic angels that were cast out of heaven, if they actually do have to use some type of vessel in order to transfer from the fourth or fifth dimension, wherever they are, into our dimension, why do we think they couldn't have gotten back in their same ships that they were in and escaped the flood or escaped the planet and come back again? That's why I believe in the multiple incursions, because everything else doesn't make any sense. Even the Tower of Babel, I remember I was reading Tom Horn's book, who was on with me last week, and Tom was talking about how this Tower of Babel was being built to reach a stargate that was above the Tower of Babel to get into the heavens and set back into the other dimension. And I think all of that's very, very plausible, because what we have to do is we have to leave the realm of science to go into the realm of supernatural. We're trying to figure out why we're here and why we've been put here. Kyle, any other comments? Well, I was wondering then, do you believe uh, that there will be another incursion and that will be the strong delusion for the end time? Absolutely. We cover that. We cover that in our, in our Watchers series. I've written about it extensively in the Cosmic Chess Match, in Amateur of Nephilim 1 and 2. Absolutely, it's going on now, right That's now right. as we speak. That's right. there is a, there, it's, look, UFOs are being seen in record numbers. There is a breeding program. A lot of people don't want to believe that, but there is a breeding program. Um, we've got an artifact which we're about to test, and that's all I can tell you about it. But once we do the testing, I will go public with it. And if it's what I think it is, we'll have proof that there is a breeding program happening. Well, I personally believe that this angel incursion has never stopped. I believe we've had thousands of years of this mess now. Yeah. And I, because, I mean, why would they stop? If they find women hot, why are they going to stop coming down here, especially if they want to do DNA testing on them? This is the same thing they did prior to the flood in which it took them thousands of years to completely destroy the human age, human DNA. Remember, they hate God. That's what the first thing you have to understand. They hate God's children because that's his progeny. They want to destroy every aspect of what God's created. And that's what their purpose is, to rob, kill, steal, and destroy, according to the word. What do you think about that, L.A.? I think it's, it's very well said. It's exactly what's going on. They hate us because we're made in the image and likeness of God. God. That's right. And in their mind, we, we cheapened, uh, when God created us, we sort of, he sort of cheapened them That's right. by making us. And so there's, there's a war. I mean, they, they absolutely hate us, and the Bible tells us at the fallen one, the fallen cherub, Satan comes to rob, kill, and destroy. That's, so right. that, that's and, and, where we are. And that's why we have these endless wars and rumors of wars and this endless bloodshed and all these people that are waiting around for the rapture that are being slaughtered. I mean, this is what they want us to do. They want us to sit around and do nothing, not be involved, not look through research, not look at the ancient history, and not realize that we are created in God's image, and that's what they want to destroy. You know, the first time I started looking at all of this information, 
and I wasn't being taught any of this in the church that I was going to, and I started realizing that this information was absolutely critical to understand who we are, what we are, and what we're doing here. And then when I began to realize that there's this little battle in the cosmos, in the unseen realms, that has been going on for eons of time, and we've basically not been made aware of that because our leaders have basically neglected to tell us, either because they didn't know or because they didn't want to know. I know a lot of pastors have a hesitancy to talk about this type of information because they don't want to be labeled as the fringe or the lunatic or whatever. But the point is this. You know, call me whatever you want to call me, just don't call me late for dinner. That's why I always say L.A. Because the reality is this. If the truth is the truth, it's always going to be the truth. If the Scripture is the answer for what we're doing and who we are and why we're here, then we need to understand why the Scripture needs to be basically read and understood. And that's what L.A. is doing for us today right now. Nick in Montana, go ahead. You're up. I heard this news blip that when the military first went into Afghanistan, they found a giant type, eight foot plus tall, in one of the caves, killed it, whisked it out of there with a helicopter, and told the GIs there that if they ever talked about it, they'd be spending time in Leavenworth. Has anything more transpired about that, or you know anything about that? Well, what's really interesting about that is a lot of some of this, <clears throat> some of these uh, apocryphal stories that you hear and read on the net. Um, I was contacted by a woman uh, who was a neighbor of a grandmother who had a son in Iraq. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we heard basically the same story, that the kid was um, on patrol. They were doing surveying in northern Iraq, and they came into this hidden valley, and they were chased out by these these giant men, obviously Nephilim, you know, 10, 11, 12 feet tall. We hear stories like this, but there's no proof. There's there's nothing. So they make great stories. Which is, which is interesting about my work, specifically Armor Trail of the Nephilim, Volume 2, we have pictures that have been photographically analyzed by um, basically a triple-blind study. And in that, we show um, one of the photographs, that, that skeleton that's there with Ralph Glidden, 1919 Catalina Island, at nine feet. We placed it at nine feet. That's incredible. So that's real. I mean, we're not making this stuff up. It's not photoshopped in any way. Ralph Glidden did not stage this. This photograph has remained hidden basically for 60 years. No one even knew about it or paid it any attention until I discovered it. So that's real scientific evidence, in my opinion. Uh, Nick, any other questions? You no, know, that's good. Uh, thanks for explaining that. Yes. Uh, okay, thanks so much, Nick, for your call. Also, L.A., I heard also in Iraq that they had found one of the, uh, I forgot what they're called, they're the special type of spaceships that was that was still inside of a static field. Did you hear about that, too? There's all sorts of stuff out there. And, you know, I, I try to keep abreast with every rumor and innuendo that's out there. I don't go public with it because there's no way to vet it. I, I try to vet everything um, before I go with it. For instance, I just want to change the subject here real quick. We discovered a uh, – we unwrapped a baby skull uh, from Peru. That was about 2,000 years old. We had carbon-14 dating. Um, so we dated this about 2,000 years old, and we were able to unwrap it at Senior Juan's Museum at the Paracas Museum in Paracas, Peru. <clears throat> and the first thing we discovered right after we unwrapped it, was this this child, this this baby skull, was extremely elongated and it had blonde hair, blondish red hair that's not supposed to be there. This these elongated skulls have been debated literally since 1842. And what we discovered is a journal in Peru um, by these two English guys uh, from 1842. And there's a lithograph that that's a picture, a lithograph of a human fetus that was discovered in a pregnant mummy, a, a woman that was about seven months pregnant that was then mummified. Listen to what this says. And this, this, you know, this debate between elongated skulls and some of its cradle headboarding, we get that, artificially elongated, but other skulls are genetic. And this, is, this debate's been raging since 1842. Listen to this. We ourselves have observed the same fact in many mummies of children of tender age who, although they had cloths about them, were yet without any vestige or appearance of pressure of the cranium. In other words, there's cloths there, but there's no head binding. More still, the same formation of the head presents itself in children yet unborn. And of this truth, we have had 
convincing proof in the sight of a fetus enclosed in the womb of a mummy of a pregnant woman which we found in a cave in Tarma. Now, all that to say this, that means that there's an outside agency affecting the genome, and that's the whole point of what we're doing. And we'll talk more about that when we come back. We'll also talk about why they're doing the headboarding to start with. When we come right back, we've got a long break. L.A. Marzulli will be right back with you. Gold is holding steady around 1235, and you wonder why I'm giving you updates on precious metals. The precious metals are going to be an indication of what's going on in our economy, what's going on with the stocks, what's going on with the collapse of a fiat currency. So uh, I'm a big proponent of precious metals, and I believe that everybody should at least hold some in their portfolio. I look at it kind of like a... When I was speaking the other day when we had Gerald Salente on, he said that he looks at gold as not something that's an investment, but something that's basically just part of his core asset structure that he always holds on to. L.A. Marzulli is my guest today. His website is lamarzulli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. I want everyone listening today to go to his website and basically – Buy something. There you go. I can't say any more clear than that. Support this man for what he's doing. I've got a phone line that just opened up. If you guys want to call in, you can get it right now, 855-995-6923. Uh, we're going to go right straight to Francis in North Carolina. Your question or comment for L.A. Marzulli, Francis, North Carolina. Hey, folks. Um, just a quick thought for you. When I was, oh, oh, by the way, and just so you know, I've been noticing this during the uh, show today. I've been hearing some interesting breathing, and I'm not sure where it's coming from or anything, but just to let you know. Um, when I was brought up as a, when I was a kid and I was brought up, um, I was understanding uh, when I attended church as a kid that uh, angels, whether they were still in heaven or had fallen to hell or whatever the way they were going, that they do not have a sex attributed to them, male or female. So the aspect of them having sex with the women or, or human females on Earth is like, okay, this is really interesting as far as barking up who knows what tree. So I'm wondering as to what your thoughts are about that. that. that, that Francis, that's an excellent question. Go ahead, L.A. Well, in, in my opinion, uh, where you're, where you're coming from is you, you're, you're citing when Jesus says you will be like the angels in heaven who neither marry or are given in marriage, but that doesn't say that we're sexless. In other words, when I put a joke about this at conferences. When we are in our translated bodies, does that mean all our, our private parts are somehow airbrushed out? No, they're not. Does it mean we procreate in the heavenly realm? I don't think so, but that's another story. The bottom line is it never says the angels are sexless. It never says that at all. It just says they, they don't marry. And it appears, it appears in the Bible from the biblical narrative that there are only male angels. What we, it's so interesting about, um, and you need to do your homework. May I suggest you go to Genesis 6 and you do a word study on who and what are the sons of God. Take it right from the Bible. Don't even go to the book of Enoch. Go to the book of Enoch the second. Go to the Bible and look up the word sons of God. You'll find it says, B'nai Ha Elohim, which always refers to the angelic host. And that's very simple. It says, so when you translate it, it would basically say, the angels of heaven saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took wives from whoever they chose and went into them and had children by them. And these were the Nephilim. These were the now, giants of old, the men of renown. Now, L.A. I'll cut this where also goes into more detail on this and how they took off their glory or their bodies or their whatever they had in order to procreate with the humans. And basically they sinned against God by doing so. And he talks about his books that basically they'll be sent into the deepest, darkest pits of hell because of that. Does that, does that have anything to do with their ability to reproduce? Do they have to do that to be able to come into this in this dimension in order to do that? Or do they just change their DNA? I mean, do you have any insight on that? Because that's always been something that's been curious to me. Well, it, it, it's a very interesting conjecture by Chuck. And um, uh, however they did it, and, and we don't know the mechanics there. We don't know, you know, exactly how they were able to do it. But we know this, that they were able to do it. Whatever the mechanic is, whatever whatever they they had to do to take form or, or, or shape shift or whatever, they were able to do it. What's interesting is the book of Enoch, going back to Enoch again, tells us that 200 watcher angels descended in the days of Jared on Mount Hermon. What's interesting, and this is the work of David Flynn, when we, when we go to the opposite side of the globe, 
um, from Mount Hermon, we wind up in Roswell, New Mexico. And David Flynn discovered this and wrote a paper on it, which caused just an incredible um, firestorm, really, in the UFO community and, 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 and essentially in the Christian community, because he, he linked, in some ways, what happened in antiquity on Mount Hermon in the Book of Enoch to what happened at the Roswell crash, 1947, which, which sort of starts the modern UFO phenomena. So it's, it's very interesting. Look, we don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. None of us do. But the bottom line is this. Something is going on, and it's very nefarious. We know that the mystery of iniquity has been working for thousands of years to create this this particular climate where the Antichrist will be able to come in, and I think we're very close to seeing that. I, I believe you're right. In fact, if you read the book, I don't know if you read the book, The Day After Roswell by a colonel who had written that. Yes, I did. Right. And that's an excellent book. And he said basically he, after all of his research into these fallen angels, aliens, whatever you want to call them, remember that's a lot of terms, but you have to remember those terms are synonymous. They can be interchanged for most authors. And he said that basically one thing he realized from all of the research that he's done, that these people are not here for our benefit. <laughs> okay. These guys are not the good guys, and we need to understand that. And uh, basically, I agree with that. Lucifer and his minions have never been here to protect us. That's why we need to be putting on the full armor of God every day. We need to be stationing the heavenly angels around us, and we need to be doing that as everything we possibly can in the, in the prayer realm, which is absolutely critical that we do that every single day. And Ned in West Virginia, go ahead. Ned in West Virginia, yeah. you're on. Uh, good morning, L.A. Thank you for your investigations, and I do, I do want to mention that because of my limiting circumstances, I've not been able to take care, take advantage of a more communication with you. But with reference to Genesis 4:1, our culture 400 years ago, when the King James was written, was at a very high level. And they were able to write things in such a way to convey deep concepts with punctuation. Notice in Genesis 4.1 that it says, Adam knew his wife Eve, semicolon, and she bare Cain. Now, if Cain were Adam's son, there would not be a semicolon there. Uh, also, in the New Testament where Jesus said, that ye are uh, children of the devil, sons of the devil. The the uh, the original uh, language where it used the word of it meant literally, physically of that person. Yeah. And that, thank you for your call. What do you think about that, L.A.? Have you already covered that this morning? Well, we sort of touched on it. Um... <clears throat> You know, it's 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 very interesting, and I understand where she's going with this. This gets into the, um, you know, it, it gets into the whole serpent seed deal that Cain. And I understand where she's going with it. I mean, it's it's a very distressing a piece of scripture. It's interesting. The rabbis don't don't look at it this way, and they and they're the people that are sort of the guardians of this. And um, you know, so I would I would go back to them, and I've asked rabbis about this. What are they and saying? you know, even even some of them are divided. So it's it's a hot button issue. I don't particularly agree with that. Um, I understand the semicolon is there. I'm looking right at it in my Bible, um, but I I think it's a stretch. But that's my, that's my opinion. Okay, Ty in Wisconsin, what's your question or comment for L.A. Marzuli? Uh, three points I'd like to make, Ted. Um, my first one is Titus 3.9 states to avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and, and so forth. In, in terms of the mark of the beast, now, Revelation 13.18 says that that is the number of a man. Spiritually interpreting the Bible with the Bible, there's two men in the New Testament, the old man and the new man, Ephesians and Colossians. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and 47 speaks of the first man and the second man. The the first man, the Adamic nature, you can be born again, but if you're still living in the flesh, the soulish realm, you have that mark or that image of the beast. Romans 8, 29 states to be conformed to the image of Christ. If we're not being conformed to the image of Christ by sowing to the Spirit, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and we're conformed to the beast, living in the flesh. Okay. Thanks for calling, Ty. What do you think about that, L.A.? Well, I, 
I, I think that, with all due respect to the caller, that he's um, he's taking scripture, but and I, I you know, he, he knows scripture very well, and I applaud him for that. <clears throat> but he's leaving out some some interesting parts where it says that without the mark of the beast, we won't be able to buy, sell, or trade. He also forgets that anyone who takes the mark winds up in a lake of fire. That's interesting. Uh, a little later on in the book of Revelation, it says. In those days, men and women will seek death and not find it. So there's something going on here. Whoever takes the mark, grievous sores appear on their bodies. We believe that these implants that we've actually taken out, um, and, we, and we've done this on film in Watchers 7 and Watchers 8, are the prototypes of the, the, of the mark of the beast. And what's interesting is a colleague and friend of mine, Doug Camp, arrived at the same conclusion that I did, um, and he wrote a book on it, Corrupting the Image. There's an interesting sidebar here, and the gentleman who posed that question has to consider this with all due respect, that anyone who takes the mark winds up in the lake of fire. There's something going on here with this mark, which changes the very fabric of the uh, the person who takes it, so much so that there is no redemption. And there's only one time in Scripture that I read where we see this, and that, of course, is with the Nephilim. Now, one thing you said, I was listening to you on another interview the other day, which I found fascinating. It was like a two-hour interview, same as today, but you were just pretty much doing a monologue with the host. And you were talking about how a lot of people, in your opinion, misinterpret what the, what the, what the Bible talks about when it talks about the rapture. And you felt the rapture may have another meaning. What was your meaning that you talked about on the show today? I want the listeners to hear this. This is very interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure where you're going with this. Another meaning well, you were saying how the rapture could be a great falling away. And then not, not necessarily that we're all going to be taken up into heaven. And it was, it was an interesting commentary that you made on that. Do you, do you remember doing that show? I don't, but this is where I think you're going with this. There's, mm -hmm. And this is very controversial. This particular See, here's what I do with the show when I'm host, hosting the show. I love to bring up every side of every argument and let everybody listening make up their own decisions and what they think about this. But go ahead. What is that controversial side thing on the rapture? Well, it talks about this, that it talks about the son of perdition that, you know, and this is from uh, Second Thessalonians, when it states that this will not happen until the great falling away, until the ap ap apostasia. Um, so he says that day, what day? The day of, of, of the revealing that that man of sin will not be revealed until the apostasia, until the apostasy, until the falling away, the departure happens. And this is a very controversial passage. Some people look at the word departure and try to shoehorn the idea that we're going to be raptured before we see the Antichrist. And frankly, I have no desire to see the Antichrist. But I read that scripture, and it seems to me that we're here, that the church is here, that there'll be a great falling away. Okay, there'll be an apostasia, which begs the question, what would cause this type of apostasy? What would cause billions or millions of people? Because remember, there's 1.8 you know, billion people uh, that are Christians on the planet. So millions of people falling away from the faith, what would cause that? And, and this presentation that I'm going to be giving uh, this weekend at the Strategic Trends Conference in Southern California, and that link is, is up, on my, up on my blog site, um, there's something very interesting here, and this is what I this is what I write. <clears throat> what is the one event that could change everyone's paradigm on the planet almost instantaneously? Something is coming. We are now wired together with the internet, okay, with 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 the satellite television network that's all over the globe. If if a UFO a mile wide lands or just just materializes over one city, it's all it's going to take, and sits there, it's it's game over. Everything changes. Everyone's paradigm paradigm is completely shaken up, and guess what? The Darwinists and the Ancient Alien series on the History Channel have been talking about this incessantly for years, telling us that we were seated here by a race of extraterrestrials, which is, of course, completely different from what um, you and I believe as biblical literalists. We believe a most high God created everything, spoke everything. We get this from John, where it says Jesus created everything, and by him all things were made. And that's what we hold to. And DNA is a creation of God. That The building blocks of life are there. But guess what? One event, one mile-wide craft over any city that just sits there for, for several days, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. And I believe this event is the great falling away is talked about in that Thessalonian passage. 
See, I've never heard anyone say that before, and everybody listened to what he just said. Now, folks, listen to me for a second, okay? I don't tell you very often to listen to me because I try, I try to be nice. But here's the thing. One second, listen to me on what I'm going to tell you what L.A. just said. Let me clarify this in case you didn't get this. He's saying that Christians basically are so shallow in their faith, if I can paraphrase him, that anything showing an alien presence on this planet, a two-mile or one-mile wide spaceship that shows up, would make everybody start to doubt the reality of Jesus Christ, doubt the reality of the Most High God, and think that we've been seated here because of all the stuff we've been hearing on TV. And that one movie that came out a few years ago, it was... Uh, Prometheus. It was, it was, it, that's right, Prometheus. is a prequel to the Alien trilogy. And basically it talked about how this happened. And see, we've been basically set up to believe this by Lucifer now from the Hollywood elite that basically are primarily Luciferians as far as I'm concerned, and basically are trying to tell us that we are not of the Most High God. And what, what L.A. is saying, and it made sense to me when he said this on the show the other day, how would it affect the churches that have been sitting around saying, oh, we're going to be raptured, nothing's going to happen to us, you know, it's all happy, happy all the time, you know, give me money, you'll be blessed. Now, forgive me, because I'm not trying to be sacrilegious on that, but the reality is we've got to tell the people the truth. That's why I brought L.A. on today, because I want you to realize there's more than one opinion to this thing, more than one opinion of what's going to happen. Okay, let's go back to the phone calls. We're running out of time. Paul in West Virginia, go ahead. I'm a scientist and like to toss some red meat on the table. I don't think they're mutually exclusive, um, some of the things you're talking about, such as the elongated heads. I believe um, but that there are – I've seen emulations in lighter cultures that emulate earlier cultures, so it could be that, that we're higher and more advanced. So you could have people trying to make their kids look like the folks that used to run the show. The same with gold, placing value in it. If you had electronics, it was valuable as a primitive, but not so much if you didn't. Um, you know, and the, um, the, our DNA has been known for a long time. The Chinese and the Mayan numerology represent it. So if somebody had the blueprint for physical life, you know, I can I can see a unifying theory where the giants were here. It would be a lot easier to make those big blocks and all those big architectures if you had a huge guys that could, you know, use levers and ropes instead of little people. And uh, I'm not so sure. What do you feel? Uh, well, let me just – I'm trying to rush here, but how do you feel about Zachariah Sitchin's um, work as far as what he's uncovered in the Sumerian writings? Because I believe – Paul, Paul let, me, let me go ahead and go to L.A. because we're okay. almost going to the break. Go ahead, L.A. Can you cover this in about a minute or so? Well, I'll, I'll try. Basically, you know, he's he's not looking at the supernatural aspect of the thing. He's talking about big guys, giants with, with ropes and pulleys. Look, the DNA evidence, the preliminary DNA evidence shows us that whoever these entities were – um, with the elongated skulls in Farakas, okay? I'm just telling you the preliminary DNA evidence. They're not Denise events, they're not Neanderthals, they're not Homo sapiens. So the mitochondrial DNA, even though it's incomplete, points to an outside agency manipulating the genome. And that's that goes back and to the veracity of the biblical narrative that we find in Genesis 6. On my website is healthmasters.com, healthmasters.com. We have a free newsletter that we send out three times a week on all the latest health issues and what's going on around the world as far as health protocols that people should or should not be following. My guest this morning for the full two hours, which, by the way, is a very difficult thing to do, is for a guest to be able to hold a crowd for two hours, which L.A. has done way past that. We're still in gridlock on the phone lines. Uh, he's been talking about the search of the Nephilim. His, his website is lamarzuli.net, L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. I want everyone to go to his website today. I want you to buy some stuff from him, support him for the incredible work that he's been doing, and I want to bring you back on as a guest in a few weeks if we can possibly get back into his schedule. But what I want people to realize is this information that we're covering this morning and this incredible response tells me something very clear, that people know something else is going on, that people know they haven't been told the truth about where we've come from, who we are, what the Bible does in Genesis chapter 6, this whole thing with Noah and the flood, and we've been taught basic Christianity without going into details of the power that we have through prayer and through the power that we have through Christ Jesus. And the one thing that I want to emphasize to you again this morning is the world that is run by Lucifer does not like Christians. They, he, Lucifer hates you. He, the Bible says he comes to rob, kill, steal, and destroy. He doesn't want you to have this alternative information. He wants to have a great falling away if a spaceship shows up because that's the way he thinks. Now, we're going to go. I want, By the way, I want to thank you, L.A., for being on with me this morning. I'm going to, let you, I'm going to take you all the way to the top of the hour. We're still loaded up with phone calls. I'm going to try to get these people that on hold for so long. Donna, Donna in California, go ahead. About the Nephilim, um, are they 
I suppose they're in the world today. Would they be like the global leaders? Also, uh, as far as the mark, everybody talks about the mark of the beast in Revelation, but there is also uh, a seal of, that's from God to his servants that he seals yes. them up. Could you uh, kind of talk about that? Well, it's interesting. There are two marks. There's the seal of God, which goes out, and um, that's the one that I think every born-again Christian should already have. And the other one, of course, is, is the counterfeit, um, the mark from the enemy, mark from the fallen one, uh, which, which, of course, anyone who takes that mark winds up in a lake of fire. And that means what is going on, what happens, what are the dynamics that changes the human being so much so that there's no grace and mercy? You know, why is it that when you take this mark, it's game over for you? And, of course, I believe, and my colleague Doug Hamp believes with his book, Corrupting the Image, that this this marker will actually, this this it will change the very genetic code so we will no longer be human. We, we will be made in the image and likeness instead of God, we will be made in the image and likeness of Lucifer. Wow. Larry in Kansas, go ahead. What's your question? In Joshua 24, it says the father served on the other side of the flood. That uh, kind of confuses me. The flood uh, flooded the whole earth and destroyed all the everything that had a breath of life. Why would they use that terminology in, in Joshua? Specifically, the terminology on the other side of the flood? Yeah. So that's like the, meet me on the other side of the lake. <laughs> that's that's a really good question. I'm going to have to explore that. I'm not, I'm not sure I have an answer for you. I, I don't. I haven't heard that one before either. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Ella, you have anything you want to close? I'm sorry to Jen in New York. I'm sorry to Sandra and all the other people that are on hold that we can't get to your phone calls. We only have we have less than a minute before we go off the air. LAMarzuli.net is the website. LA, you let me go ahead. Do you have any final comments? Just real quick, Ted, I'd love to come back on and pick up where we left off. There's so much to talk about. Amitrail of Nephilim 1 and 2. I guarantee you these are oversized books, 8 and a half by 11, full-color pictures. You will be amazed, and I say that uh, because it's true. Okay. I, want thank, I, want, I, want to, I want to thank you again, L.A. Incredible topic this morning, incredible guest. Uh, absolutely loved it. God bless you. We'll see you next time I'm on.